Great. So um, my name is Sharla. I work for Ocean Missions NGO and for the University of Iceland's Research Center in Husavik. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for having me. I wish I was there in person, but in the end, uh, with the beautiful spring weather that we're having in the north of Iceland, it ended up that I'm here online, but I'm very happy to be here to tell you a little bit more about Ocean Missions NGO and the uh, sailing expeditions that we are running and tours, and specifically the microplastic research that we are conducting on those tours. So first, just a little bit about the NGO. Ocean Missions was founded in 2019 in Husvik, here in the northeast of Iceland. And um, our main mission is to inspire people to take direct action to protect the ocean. So we really felt like there was a need in Iceland and beyond in the Arctic regions to shine a spotlight on conservation and sustainability and sustainable tourism. Um, so we are really focused on citizen science and education and being able to conduct research that everybody can be involved in and using that research to really spread the word about issues in the ocean, such as microplastic, and how we can become more sustainable and start taking better care of the ocean, especially in the Arctic regions. So I wanted to introduce you uh, briefly to the core team that we have right now. So Ocean Missions was started by Belen and Hamir here in Husavik. And Hamir is the captain of the main boat that we're using, which is North Sailing's hybrid electric schooner Opal. And Belen was working for North Sailing. She's also now a PhD student at Howie. And I joined them shortly after as a scientific advisor. And the main goal, um, in the beginning of Ocean Missions was to see if we could set up citizen science sailing expeditions where people would join us and help us collect data. Um, so we focused on building a program uh, that was educational and hands-on and that people could learn and we could learn from the guests that join us. Since then, our team has really been growing. Um, and Nora now actually isn't based in Iceland. She's based in Australia, uh, so, but she's still working with us online. Uh, she's making beautiful maps and graphics for us. Taime is coming here every summer. Uh, she's working as crew on the boats and helping out with everything. She's also a big presence on our social media and doing graphic design for us. Joanna, who maybe many of you know, and you're going to hear from her soon, she is now the Aquarary or the AF here, their beach cleanup coordinator. And Carlotta, she is here in the summer as the Husavik area beach cleanup coordinator. So as I mentioned, we wanted to create a community of ocean ambassadors, as we're calling it, um, through our both our longer sailing expeditions and short tours, uh, which I'm also going to tell you a little bit about, where we're mainly studying both micro and macro plastic pollution. So we're taking microplastic samples, which are traditionally five millimeters or smaller, um, from the ocean. And then we are also um, doing macroplastic research, which you'll hear more about through beach cleanups and keeping a database of the types of plastic and the different debris that we're picking up on beaches. And we want to work together with uh, the communities in Iceland on both sustainable tourism and also ocean literacy. So we have conducted courses in the schools and um, given presentations around the country about, about the ocean in Iceland, how we can take care of it, and um, the issues that it's facing. We also now have international partners such as Mission Blue, uh, the organization in the US that we are working with on uh, our goals about ocean conservation. So traditionally, when we started doing sailing expeditions, they were going either from Reykjavik to Husavik or uh, vice versa, the other way around, uh, for seven days using, as I mentioned, the hybrid electric schooner Opal, which you're seeing a beautiful drawing of in the bottom left there. And on our expeditions, um, we're able to teach our passengers about traditional sailing um, because Opal is a traditional sailing schooner. We're doing whale and bird surveys. 
We're engaging with the local communities along the way, um, stopping meeting people in, in different places, sometimes having people join us on board uh, to give us inspiring talks about the work that they're doing. Um, and then we're doing the microplastic research and the beach cleanups, as I mentioned. Of course, we're doing a lot of exploring uh, during those seven days, taking plastic and plankton samples uh, back with us for further analysis, and also working on personal development um, about sustainability and connection to nature. Then um, we also partnered with North Sailing to run a whale sales and science tour every summer here in Husavik. So basically then we're doing a mini version of, of what we'd like to do on the expeditions, primarily focused on microplastic sampling, which I'm gonna tell you more about in a minute. Um, so these are like three and a half hour tours here in Scalfandi Bay, where the main goal is to do a microplastic trawl and teach people about plastic in the ocean and also hopefully um, do some sailing and see the whales here in the bay. Then we started expeditions, sailing expeditions in what is now known as the Northeast Iceland Hope Spot. So Mission Blue um, recognizes special areas in the ocean that are considered important for ocean health and should be conserved. And they recognize them as hope spots. And so we created the Northeast Iceland Hope Spot. It was official last year. And that contains Scalfandi Bay, Eyjafjörður, and Grimsey. Um, so now we've started to focus expeditions in this area and studying our area specifically. And I probably don't need to tell uh, many of you why Iceland in general and especially our Hope Spot area is important and why we want to um, promote sustainability and ocean health here in this area. But I will tell you uh, or remind you of a few of the reasons. So 20 different species have been recorded of whales, dolphins or porpoises in this area. So when we're doing our uh, sailing tours or our expeditions, we are logging all the locations that we see whales and logging the number and the species. So commonly we see white beaked dolphins. We're really lucky in May and June to see the blue whale. Of course, the humpback whales and the minke whales. So that's just four of 20 species that have been recorded here in this area. And you probably also know that um, there are major bird nesting colonies um, all around Iceland and many important ones here in, in Northeast Iceland within the Hope Spot. So during our sailing expeditions, we are doing pelagic bird surveys using the eBird app. And for that, we are counting uh, the number and the species of each birds that we see. Um, the Northeast Iceland Hope Spot, it contains two of the strongest puffin colonies in Iceland now, um, in Lunde Island in Skjalfandi and on Grimsey. Prise in Eyjafjörður is known to contain one of the largest, if not the largest, breeding colony of Arctic terns. And there are several other species, for example, you're seeing the razorbill and the kittiwake. So we are keeping track of what we see and where during our expeditions. And there's many other interesting things in this area. Of course, it's an upwelling area. So that means that it's a very good feeding ground. And that's why all of these animals are coming here. There's Greenland sharks in this area. They're known to be the longest living vertebrate in the world. The estimate is about 500 years that they can live. There are also seal colonies in the area. In Eyjafjörður, there's the hydrothermal vent ecosystem. So there's a lot of very interesting things going on in this area that uh, need to be recognized and, and conserved. And this is why this area was recognized as, as a hope spot. So I'm going to focus primarily on the microplastic research that we're doing during our sailing expeditions and tours. And this consists primarily of four steps. So the first step is that we're microplastic trawling uh, with our manta trawls. These aren't true manta trawls. Uh, the one you're seeing here in the picture in step one, this is a laddie or a, a low-tech aquatic debris instrument. Um, and the, the plans for the laddie are actually online. And so organizations like ours are building our own 
Laddie trawls, um, and there's a standardized method to do this. And then we're using them to trawl for microplastic samples um, while we're sailing. So we're using this one, or also there is a version that looks a little bit different called the Avani. Um, either we are doing three zigzag transects uh, during our sailing expeditions, or we're doing a minimum 30 minute straight line trawl on our whale sales and science tour. So that's what we're using to get the samples. And then the next step right on the boat and with the help of the passengers on board, we are then filtering the samples through uh, metal sieves of 0.3 millimeters and one millimeter. And then we're just going through the sieves and we are picking out everything that we believe could be microplastic samples. From there, we're trying to visually confirm uh, if this is truly plastic that we picked out of the samples or not. So we have a stereo microscope on board and you can also do testing such as the hot needle test. So what you do is you heat up a sewing needle and then you can touch it to the, to the particle. If it is plastic, it will start to melt. Whereas if it's organic material, it will burn. Um, so that's a way that you can confirm whether what you picked out is plastic or not. And then the very last step, um, we're of course counting the particles, uh, we're recording the size and the type, and I'll show you the types in another slide. And then the very final step that we are going through with some of the samples now is to actually confirm uh, what they are through spectroscopy. So using FTIR or Raman, where basically you're looking at the chemical composition of the plastics and determining, of course, first, is it truly plastic like we thought it was? And then also what type of plastic is it? So I can give you just, a, I hope, a very, very short look at what this might look like. So you're gonna see our um, Manta Laddie trawl going into the water um, and just what it looks like on board. So that's just a super short clip of what it looks like. And then this is an example of what it looks like afterwards. So after we've been taking these samples over the past years and analyzing them, um, we're starting to be able to map out and look at the results of what we're getting from the expeditions. So we've completed 90 trawls from 2019 to 2023 and 72 of them have contained microplastic. Um, but the concentrations are highly variable. It's really changing from one trawl to the other. It's affected a lot by the weather, by the currents. Um, so it's not uniform where you're seeing microplastic in the ocean. And a place that you saw it on the first day, it could not be there anymore in samples that you take the next day. So it's changing a lot. Overall, we've been able to um, collect 835 uh, confirmed particles of microplastic that we've been able to analyze. And you're seeing on the left the map of all the trawls that we've done and what the results look like in the different regions. So of course, in the Northeast, because we have both Hope Spot sailing expeditions and our whale sales and science tour, that's where we have the most information coming from is in our area. We've been able to do 62 trawls over the years, um, but still the results are really highly uh, variable, but about 4,000 uh, microplastic particles per kilometer squared is the estimate, um, which is one of the highest. But the highest is actually Reckinus, uh, down in the Faxafloy region, um, closer to 5,000 microplastic particles uh, per kilometer square. On the right, you're seeing a graph that is showing the areas and the MP, which is microplastic, or MP with PBP, it says, which is possible boat paint. So what we have discovered uh, through our samples is that a lot of the times we are getting what appears to be little tiny pieces of paint in the samples. And uh, this is something that is not traditionally counted in microplastic uh, sampling, but since we were seeing it so often, we started to collect that and um, see how much that is contributing. And you can see, so for example, especially in the West Fjords, um, there was a 
big concentration of, of boat paint. Um, so that's something that we're now looking into is how is the boat paint contributing uh, to plastic particles in the ocean? So I mentioned that there's different types of microplastic. And so when we break it down into the types, so there's lines, films, foams, fragments, um, those, and pellets. Those are the traditional um, categories that you break microplastic down into. And then you have possible boat paint, as I just mentioned. So the main category that we're finding is lines. And I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but in the first circle, this blue uh, particle, that's typically what we're seeing as a line. And basically what this most likely is all coming from is fishing gear. So you have the big fishing ropes that once they're um, lost in the ocean or they're on the beach and the waves are hitting them, they're breaking down into all of these tiny little pieces of line. So that is the primary thing that we're finding in our samples. Overall, if we combine everything, it's almost 37% of all the particles that we've collected. When you break it down per location, like you're seeing on the left, um, in many areas is over 50% of what we collect is these pieces of line coming from fishing gear. Then the next thing is fragments, and that's the second uh, bubble with the red piece of plastic that you're seeing up on the top. Fragments are basically broken up pieces of plastic that most of the time we're not able to see uh, what it is. It could be from those big plastic fishing boxes. It could be from plastic bottles. It could be from buckets, pails, all of these types of things. So it's little something that was larger broken down into little fragments. So that's the next largest um, category that we're seeing. And then comes the possible boat paint if we include that. Um, that's almost... Uh, that's over 18% of everything that we've collected. If we want to look more closely just in our region, which is now the Hope Spot region, Eyjafjörður, there's Galfandi and Grimsey, um, you can see that Grimsey actually has the highest concentration, basically double uh, what we have calculated for Skelfandi and Eyjafjörður. And we believe that that really has a lot to do with the currents and that the currents are really pushing everything to Grimsey. And we had a really interesting example of that on one of our expeditions. Um, during a beach cleanup on Grimsey, I actually found a message in a bottle and it was um, thrown into the ocean by a little little Icelandic girl. She had written a note in it and she threw it in the ocean in Siglufjörður and then it went straight to, to the beach in Grimsey. So it was just a clear example of how everything that's ending up in the ocean on the coast of mainland Iceland is actually being pushed to Grimsey. So that's probably why we're getting really high uh, microplastic concentrations there, uh, double Skalfandi and Eyjafjörður. If we wanna look at the categories, it actually looks very similar to what our data looks like for the whole of Iceland combined. Um, it's again where these lines are dominating, primarily coming from fishing gear. And then next is the fragments, the broken up pieces. Um, so we see very similar data here in the hope spot than we're seeing in, in all of Iceland. So just a few points that I want to further discuss about this. So one of the things that we've really found is the power of education and outreach. So since we are running all of our tours and collecting all of our data in collaboration with citizen scientists, people that are just interested in the topic and want to help, it's been really powerful. Um, every, we've had many people coming and helping us and in turn, they are learning something about this type of research and about sustainability and plastic in the ocean. So it has been really um, a powerful exchange to be able to run this all as citizen science. And then some of the things that are coming out of the microplastic collection that we've done is the pollution from fishing gear uh, seems to be one of the major problems in Iceland um, because the majority, as I mentioned, seems to be coming from the fishing industry. And 
as it's well known, Iceland is um, uh, has intense fishing activity and it's very important to the economy. So that should probably be high on the list of looking at how we can try to make the fishing industry more sustainable in terms of the gear that's being used, how much gear is being lost, what's happening to the gear, um, this type of thing, because it is a major contributor to microplastic in Iceland that we've found. And also I mentioned uh, what's been interesting in our samples is the amount of paint that we're finding and that that is traditionally not included in microplastic studies. Um, so we believe that it's probably paint coming from boats uh, would make the most sense. And it could be a source of contamination in our samples, meaning that the paint that we're getting in our samples is coming from the boat that we're using. But either way, um, it's revealing that there is a lot of microplastic paint in the ocean here. And it's not really known a lot about what that might, uh, how that might be affecting paint can, different types of paint can be toxic. They can also different types of toxic can, can stick to paint particles. Um, so that's something that really needs to be further researched here. And of course, with the microplastic in the ocean, we are concerned about the threats uh, to the wildlife here. Um, so we had very high concentration, um, even though it was very variable all over the place uh, um, and very high uh, confidence intervals. So meaning that uh, we're not confident in the estimates. It could be anywhere from zero to 10,000 particles in, in some places. And that's because of the currents and, and the weather affecting where the microplastics are found. But either way, one of the takeaways should be that we're finding microplastics in all of the areas that we are sailing through in Iceland, and especially in our Hope Spot area here in the Northeast. And we know that this could be having negative impacts on the wildlife here. Um, so one of the concerns is that microplastic actually um, carries toxins and toxins actually stick to plastic. And so then the animals that are um, consuming the microplastic are then could have disruptions to their uh, life functions um, because they're actually getting higher toxins in their body. So that's definitely one of the major concerns um, in terms of finding the microplastic all around Iceland. So now we are working on education of, of these issues, um, presenting everything that we have found and trying to now look at solutions and how can we be more sustainable, how can we minimize plastic use in Iceland, how can we minimize the fishing gear in the ocean, um, these types of things. So that's a really important conversation that we need to be having now. Um, and that is kind of the next step is now that we have collected all this data, we need to now use it to start looking for uh, solutions to this problem. So thank you very much again for having me and I look forward to discussing everything further uh, at the end of the session.